It's time for question time. Can preparation design improve the prognosis for treating severely damaged endodontically treated teeth with a post and core? Yeah, the answer is yes. There's no faffing around here. We're getting straight to the point. And we're going to be spending the majority of our time in this little mini lecture analyzing the how and the why of that realization. So let's kick things off. Here we can see two seemingly very different images. On the right we can see a pair of porcelain fused metal crowns and on the left hand side we can see probably one of the most iconic characters played by Hugh Laurie, Dr Gregory House, the disgruntled but very brilliant physician. Now it turns out that these two images actually have something in common with one another. So have a think. What might that be? Because like I said, there is a common denominator. Can't think of it? No? God, you've got no idea, do you? The answers are feral. I mean, the answer's literally in the title of the video. So let's start from the beginning, shall we? What is a feral? That's a good question to ask because the word feral, it's unusual, right? It's a weird word. And it turns out that it stems from every schoolboy's favourite dead language, Latin. Actually stems from two words, ferrum, which means iron, and viriola, which translates roughly to small bracelet. So it's a small iron bracelet. That's what a ferrule is. So let's take a closer look at Dr. House's walking cane. Notice the small iron bracelet around the neck of the cane, the weakest part of the cane, where most of the pressure builds up, has been strengthened, reinforced with a small iron bracelet, a ferrule. Now a porcelain fused to metal crown, in fact all conventional crowns for that matter, have a corresponding region that is strengthened by this metallic bracelet. And it is this region here, highlighted in green, the outermost region of the crown, nearest to the margins of the preparation. That area can be denoted as the ferrule. And just for the sake of clarity, the ferrule doesn't necessarily have to be made out of metal. The term is not material specific. It is specifically referring to a region of the crown highlighted in green. Now let's put the concept of the ferrule into practice. Here we can see a preparation with a core resting on top of it. Now let's have another look at that porcelain fused to metal crown where we've already established where the ferrule is. Now imagine that you seat that crown onto the preparation. The region of the ferrule corresponds to the axial walls of the preparation, also highlighted in green. And you want those axial walls to extend 360 degrees all the way around the core. Having the ferrule area of the crown be in contact with the axial walls of your preparation is highly advantageous. And that's because during mastication, during function, lateral forces occur. And you want tooth substance to act as a brace because without it, all of those forces will be absorbed by the crown and the post and the core, which can lead to root fracture. Let's take a moment to discuss another aspect of design which is worth contemplating. And it's how we might go about designing the occlusal surface of our preparation, the plateau, if you will, upon which our core will rest. That area is highlighted in green and we need a minimum thickness of one millimeter of sound dentine. Anything less than that and the tooth will be structurally compromised and the risk of fracture will increase. Take a closer look at the occlusal surface and the way in which it's been shaped because it's not flat. The sides are sloped. In fact, it's very reminiscent of a rooftop, a gable roof to be more precise. Now, why would you want to shape the occlusal surface of your preparation like a rooftop? Why would we want to do that? But to understand why, 
we must first have a look at what happens when we use a flat occlusal surface because we can actually model what happens using finite element analysis. In this picture, we can see a tooth that's been restored with a post and core and we load it axially. And the areas that appear red, that's where a lot of the forces are being accumulated. And we can see that the post and core is quite effective at absorbing most of those forces, but it's not perfect. Quite a lot of the forces accumulate around the cervical area of the root, which can lead to fracture. So then, if we design our occlusal surface like a rooftop, what happens then? Well, upon loading, those forces will be diverted away from the cervical area of the root and will decrease the risk of fracture. So that's what we're after. We want to divert those forces away from the cervical area. Sounds like bad dating advice, but when it comes to posts and cores, very good advice. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We need to take a step back and take a closer look at those axial walls of our preparation. I mentioned previously that you want to have axial walls that extend 360 degrees around the core. But I didn't mention anything about the height of those axial walls. And that is very important. In fact, the concept of the ferrule effect is so important that there's even a literature review dedicated to that sole topic. And in that review, they conclude that you need a minimum requirement of one and a half to two millimeters of height for your axial walls. Now this finding elucidating the importance of the ferrule effect is echoed across numerous systematic reviews. Now maybe you fancy yourself as a bit of a maverick and you decide to by totally disregarding the minimum height requirement of one and a half to two millimeters for your axial walls. And you decide to just go ahead with doing your post and core anyway. Now here's an illustration of what that might end up looking like. Notice that the margins of the crown are at the same level as the most inferior part of the core. Now with this configuration, during function, those very same lateral forces will be absorbed by the crown and by the post and core. But what will end up happening is that those forces will accumulate at very small, specific regions of the tooth. Now, high force being applied to a small area is literally the recipe for pressure. So you'll increase the risk of the root fracturing. Now this, this is what we want to see. In this configuration, we've got our axial walls, which will help act as a brace. So when we apply those lateral forces, the tooth itself will be able to absorb those forces and distribute them in and around the root in a more favorable manner, thus decreasing the risk of fracture. So what about this scenario right here? Here our axial walls don't live up to our requirement of one and a half to two millimeters. Or maybe we come in contact with another case where perhaps half of the tooth does live up to our requirements, but not the other half. You get the picture. How do we go about restoring this kind of a tooth. Now, just to be clear, this is the end result we're striving for, right? I mean, we want our axial walls to be two millimeters so that we can achieve the ferrule effect. And we also want the margin of our preparation to be situated roughly two and a half millimeters away from the alveolar crest of the bone. Now, given that this is what we've got to work with, literally no height whatsoever, our axial walls are at zero millimeters pretty much now, right? Well, how about we just prepare the tooth subgingivally and create two millimeters? That's one alternative, right? Well, turns out that that might not be the best idea because of a concept that was previously known as the biological width. Back in 2017, during a world workshop, a bunch of expert periodontists got together for a chin wag and they realized that the term biological width was pretty useless because when you think about it the entire human body is made of biological tissues so saying biological width doesn't tell you anything 
So they decided a new term would be in order. And the term that they settled upon was supracrystal tissue attachment. A vast improvement. In this illustration, we can see that the supracrystal tissue attachment is composed of two separate <laughs> biological widths, so to speak. You've got the junctional epithelium and the connective tissue. Now, each one of those is roughly one millimeter in thickness. So together, call it roughly two millimeters. Okay, that's the supracrystal tissue attachment. Now, if you aggressively prepare the tooth by placing your margins within the supracrystal tissue attachment, impinging upon that sacred periodontal area, you'll create complications and uncertainty because the body will want to create a new supracrystal tissue attachment. The only viable option in this scenario is to place your margin within the sulcus. Under no circumstances should you impinge upon the supracrystal tissue attachment. And by placing your margin within the sulcus, there's no guarantee that you will be able to establish axial walls of one and a half to two millimeters. If you can't achieve that, there are two other options that might be available, orthodontic extrusion and surgical crown lengthening. This is a scientific article written by two Swedish professors, and it's quite unusual. Atypical in the sense that it's not a clinical study. It's not even an in vitro study. What it is, is a theoretical, abstract thinking kind of an article, and it's worth spending a moment to talk about it. The article provides us with a framework for how the post and core are interrelated. What does the core actually support? Well, the crown, obviously. So what we can start by doing is helping our patient into centric occlusion so that we can analyze the intermaxillary space. How much space is actually available for our crown? Once we know that, we can estimate roughly how high our core is going to have to be. Once you know the height of the core, you can infer that the post need only be longer than the core. So with the help of this illustration, X needs to be greater than Y. The post needs to be longer than the core. That's the conclusion they reach. They don't provide any exact measurements whatsoever in the article. It is a simple guideline. The post needs to be longer than the core. But this isn't the only recommendation that can be gleaned from this article. Something else that's really important is discussed here. And that's how far down, apically, into the root can you actually extend your post in relationship to the alveolar crest, the highest point of the marginal bone surrounding the root? It's a fantastic question to ask. And it turns out that if you place the most apical point of your post at the same level as the alveolar crest, like we can see in this illustration, then you're in deep trouble. Give me a lever arm long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world, said Archimedes, one of the greatest Greeks from antiquity. So we must never, ever underestimate the damage we can cause if we accidentally place a lever arm and a fulcrum inside our patient's tooth. So what should we do? The apical tip of the post should be placed either above or below the alveolar crest. It's very simple, either above the bone or below the height of the bone. Do that and you'll keep Archimedes happy. It's question time again. How much gutta percha should you remove during the post preparation procedure? You know, so how much gutta percha can you realistically end up leaving if you don't want to incur some sort of a complication further down the line, you know, without compromising the quality of your endodontic treatment. This study by Thomas Quist helps shed some light on this intriguing question. And it turns out that we can leave three millimeters of gutta percha without compromising the integrity of our endodontic treatment. However, there is something really important that I need to stress before we continue. 
There is an inherent risk of misinterpreting the conclusion from this study. If you were to tell me that you could increase the retention of a posting core by increasing the length of the post into the root canal, you'd be accurate, that's true. And here we have a study saying that it's okay to leave three millimeters of gutta percha within the root canal. So you could therefore conclude that in the interest of maximizing retention, you're going to increase the length of the post and always leave three millimeters of gutta percha remaining. That is a conclusion that you could realistically and conceivably arrive at, but it is unfortunately misguided because three millimeters of gutta percha remaining is the bare minimum requirement. Ideally, we want to preserve as much as possible. Remember what the two Scandinavian professors told us? The post only needs to be longer than the core. Once you've done that, you're golden. If you extend the post and intentionally just leave three millimeters of gutta percha remaining, you're going to unnecessarily weaken the tooth and increase the risk of fracture. Three millimeters is the bare minimum. Strive to save as much gutta percha as you possibly can. Because here's the thing, right? If there's one thing that several research groups can actually agree upon within this sphere, if you look at the findings from several systematic reviews, several research groups agree that preserving tooth substance improves the prognosis for the tooth dramatically. So let that permeate the way in which you practice dentistry. Be minimally invasive. Even prior to doing your post and core, when you're doing your endodontic treatment, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but I can appreciate that you want to, you know, create an access cavity that will uh, allow you to properly visualize and instrument the root canals, but try to save and salvage as much tooth substance as you possibly can. And if you're not going to do the endodontic treatment yourself, if you're going to refer the patient, you know, let that person know what you plan to do with the tooth in the future. Point in case being this image right here, patient referred to an endodontist specialist for root canal treatment. Such a shame I don't have the before shot so you can get a feel for how much tooth substance was lost during the process. Beautiful root filling, but it cost a lot of coronal tooth substance. In fact, let's enlarge the image, take a closer look at this thing. Huge access cavity, wafer thin walls remaining. So yeah, let's take a moment and remember what's left of this tooth. Didn't see that endodontist coming, did you buddy? Neither did I. <laughs>